Well, good morning, everyone at Mount Olive from isolation in Jenny's bedroom. I'm going to give it a second or two longer to make sure that Jim and everyone else has the screen set up and the volumes adjusted correctly. Uh, hopefully you have that done by now. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. These are words that I am sure we have all heard before, uh, not just maybe in Bible study, but perhaps you've been watching TV and you've seen a, a cop say it to a suspect that they're trying to get to confess, or maybe they've come up in some philosophical conversation about what is truth. It's a phrase that gets thrown around quite a bit in our world, uh, and it can be twisted to mean many different things, but what does it actually mean? What was Jesus talking about when he said these words? Well, we should probably take a look at the text. Verse 31 says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So Jesus isn't necessarily talking to an openly hostile audience in here. Uh, right before this, we heard that there were many people who were believing what Jesus had to say. And so Jesus is talking to these Jews who had at least at that point, or were starting to, or had it at one point, were, were believing in him. And he tells them, if you abide in my word, if you, if you remain in my word, if, if you don't let my word get snatched away or, or get choked out like what happened to the, you know, like the other seeds in the parable of the sower, if you abide, if you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then he says those words, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, we see in the text that this con confuses the Jews a bit. They, they said, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, th this passage always makes me want to scratch my head. Like, <laughs> are these guys not aware of their history? Uh, do you not remember, oh, this little place called Egypt? I, I mean, there's an entire book of the Bible about this event, about being slaves in Egypt and God setting you free. But even beyond that, there was the Assyrians who carried off the, the, the northern kingdom into exile. There were the Babylonians who carried off the, the southern kingdom into exile. After that, there were the Persians. It, it, it was better they were able to return home to Jerusalem, but they were still under Persian control. And then there were the Greeks, and then there were the Romans. They are currently under Roman occupation. You're not really free. But what about us? Well, we live in the land of the free. We have documents that testify, that outline all of the freedoms that we have. But does that make us free? What sort of things enslave or control us? What about finances? How many people are controlled by a mortgage payment, a car payment, credit card payment, student loan payments, and so many other debts? What about youth sports or, or other activities? How much do those things control you or enslave you? What have you had to sacrifice for, for, to get your kid to the next level so that they could get to the next level, all for the sake of setting them up to get to that next level? And then there's that next level they have to get to. When does it end? Or uh, we are so often controlled by just our, our busy schedule in, in general. Or for our desire for, for status or, or these pressing needs that just pile themselves up on us. Are we really free? I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe we can do something about all of those things that control us. We can, we can get our budget balanced and find financial freedom. We can try to find balance in other areas of our lives and, and free up our schedule so we don't feel like it's controlling us. I mean, even Jesus' audience, who claimed to be free, in a sense they were, even though they were under Roman occupation, they were still able to freely practice their religion. But is that what Jesus is talking about? Is he talking about some sort of temporary earthly freedom that we will experience if we know the truth? Well, verse 34 says, Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. What does it mean to be a slave to sin? 
Well, I, th- I think we can think about it in two ways. First, we, we all have faced temptations, right? We all have our, our pet sins that we struggle with, whether it's gossip or anger, uh, uh, lust or pride or, or jealousy or a combination of all of those. And when we give in to those temptations, it can feel like sin controls us, like, like it's our master and we are its slave. Will we ever be free? Well, we can fight temptation. We, we can try and, and we might succeed sometimes, but we also constantly fail. When we do, we can find comfort in Christ's words, where he says in verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You are free. While we still wrestle with sin and always will on this side of eternity, we can also find comfort in God's promise. That because of what Christ has done for us, because of his life, his death, his resurrection for you, you are free. Believe that. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, that leads to the, to the second way I, I think we can, we can think about being a slave to sin. And I think this way is actually a little bit more relevant to, to the Reformation and Reformation Day, which we are celebrating today. One way you could become a slave is if you had some sort of outstanding debt. And I am now a slave until I am able to, to pay my debt, until I am able to make things right. Now, we're all sinners. We've all sinned. And because we have all sinned, we all have a debt to pay. And no matter how hard you work, no matter how righteous you try to become, we will never be able to pay that debt. We will continue to be a slave. But if the Son has paid the debt for us, we are free. The Son has set us free. He has paid the debt. We are free. So, good Lutheran question, what does this mean? Well, in his tract on the freedom of the Christian, which was published in 1520, Martin Luther stated two propositions that on their surface seem to be completely contradictory to one another. Martin Luther wrote this, A Christian is an utterly free man, Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is an utterly dutiful man, servant of all, subject to all. Well, what do those two things mean, and, and, and what does that have to do with what we've been talking about? Well, prior to the rediscovery of, of the gospel, which took place at the Reformation, people were slaves to sin. P- people either just simply gave in to their temptation and, and they allowed sin to control them, or People slavishly tried to pay their own debt. They they tried to stockpile enough good works, enough of their own righteousness. They tried to they they were a slave to trying to pay off this debt, to pay what was owed. And then the gospel was rediscovered that we are saved by grace through faith. That the debt has been paid. That that your good works are are no longer good here. That's great. We're free. But but now what what do I do with all of these good works that I have been stockpiling up, that I have been trying to hoard in order to pay this debt that I owe? Because God doesn't want them. God doesn't need them. Do you know who does need those good works? Your neighbor. And so rather than using the freedom I have in Christ in order to serve myself and in order to live my own free life, I use my freedom in the gospel and the good works that God neither requires nor needs. I use them in order to serve my neighbor who does need those good works. And I do so freely. You are free. Not because you have been such a good servant and earned that freedom. You are a servant because of the perfect obedience of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, because he has set you free and has set you free to serve. 
Amen. And now, may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much for all of your prayers uh, over the past few weeks and your words of encouragement. And those of you who have dropped off treats for for Rachel and and whatnot, uh, I am feeling great. Uh, So is Ginny. And uh, we cannot wait to be back with you guys next week. Have a blessed Reformation Day and a wonderful rest of the service. Amen.